and share my screen and there we go okay um yes welcome everybody the we are recording on zoom right now and uh up front there's two handouts confusingly ordered into uh three pieces of paper two different piles two from this pile one from this pile uh, the uh, the location, like the, the electronic version of those handouts, where they're located is, is under the, uh, the quiz uh, SQL repository. I printed out the create tables.sql file and the quiz practice.sql file, these two files right here. And we're going to spend most of today going over all of the material for the quiz and uh, and how, what the format of the quiz will look like and uh, all the SQL needed for the quiz. The, if you're on the topic four folder in the class, the way to get to find the quiz material electronically is there is this uh, get submodule right here, SQL quiz. And if you click on that, that'll take you to the uh, SQL quiz repository. And in there again, it's the create tables.sql file and the quiz practice.sql file that I've printed out so that you can have access to that on the, uh, uh, the quiz day itself. And we're going to go over that material in class today. Over on this screen, I have uh, two terminal windows opened up to the, uh, the quiz SQL file or the quiz SQL repo. Um, so git clone that, um, this repository right here to get access to it. And um, the quiz practice.sql, I'm gonna open that up right there. At the top, it has the instructions of how to uh, actually uh, get access to all of the material for the quiz and uh, bring up the appropriate Docker containers and get into a PSQL environment. And then the quiz itself is just a bunch, will be just a bunch of SQL questions uh, that you'll have to be able to predict. What is the output of the SQL command based on the input? Um, you're welcome to inspect anything that you want in here, but the, uh, the important thing is this create tables.sql. If we take a look at that, create tables. This has just uh, two uh, tables inside of it with a couple of insert commands. The semantics, the meaning behind these uh, tables, uh, it's very abstract. The intention is that like, you shouldn't be getting caught up in the meaning behind these tables, but just focusing on like the abstract, uh, uh, just what do the commands do without any semantic meaning. And these, uh, all this information is taken from this Postgres tutorial.com website right here. So if you want the like uh, written version of all the explanations we're going through, this is the place to uh, visit for that. Um, but we'll be going over just, I guess, verbally running these commands here in class today uh, in order to um, uh, see all these weird edge cases in SQL. In order to go over what, in order to follow along in class today, you'll want to have that SQL quiz repo uh, cloned onto the Lambda server and be inside of it. And um, then you'll be able to uh, run through copying along, doing everything that I'm doing and making sure that your environment works. There's a lot of stuff, uh, but any questions just on the setup of like getting access to the, to the material for the quiz or those sort of administrative details. Okay, uh, I'm gonna open up in another tab, the quiz practice.sql file. These here are the commands again that uh, uh, you can run to make sure that you are in the proper environment. These first two commands or first three really are uh, you're welcome to run them if you want, uh, but if you've already cloned the repository somewhere, you don't have to rerun these commands. And then the next three commands down here are just bringing up the normal uh, Docker environment. If you run down here, so I'll run Docker PS. So we can see that I have, I've already had this running. So I'll uh, go ahead and bring it down, Docker compose down. 
Docker PS. Now there's nothing running. I run Docker compose build. It'll run. Up. I have to not have a typo. Mine will run really quickly because I've already built it. Yours will take a little bit longer to run. And then the Docker compose up dash D to have it running in the background. And then we'll be able to connect to it uh, with this uh, PSQL <laughs> command and run things actually in the um, uh, the database, if I type the backslash D command right here, then we'll just get that there's this basket A and basket B table, which again, correspond to the contents of this create tables.sql file. Uh, are we all good about the setup where we're at? No questions? Okay. One last administrative thing about the quiz itself. Um, come down to the bottom of this little header section. Um, well, so in this, this file, there's just a whole bunch of SQL commands that are gonna be illustrating all of the different concepts and edge cases that you're responsible for knowing for the quiz. The quiz itself is just gonna be four select statements. Uh, taken not exactly from uh, this document, but uh, almost exactly from this document, inspired by this document. And um, then you'll have to write what the output is. The difference between, one of the differences between this quiz and the last quizzes is, is that now um, you'll still have four problems, but each problem will be worth two points instead of one point. So the overall quiz itself will be worth eight points instead of four points. Um, the, Everything that we're gonna to cover today is all stuff that you'll need for the, uh, for the first uh, Pagilla homework assignment. And then we'll also have a quiz next week using the same sort of format that will have uh, uh, new SQL concepts related to the a second version of the Pagilla homework assignment. Uh, question, yes. So the question is getting to actually this quiz practice.sql file and um, the uh, you'll have to clone the uh, the GitHub repository into whatever folder you would like to be inside of here. This first commands just makes it inside of the quiz folder and then you enter that um, that uh, folder inside of that folder. So inside of the uh, the repo, there are two uh, SQL files, create tables and quiz practice. And if you do something like vim dash p star dot SQL, again, the glob right here will match all of the SQL files. The dash p opens them all in their own separate tabs. And now we'll have access to uh, both of them like this. GT switching back and forth between my tabs. One last thing in this header up here is there's this um, incantation right here, which will uh, we use the input redirection to pass the entire contents of the quiz practice.sql file uh, directly uh, to psql. And uh, the dash a flag here applies to the psql, and this will echo out all the commands. And so if you were to run something like this, were to run something like this down here, that will show you all of the problems in the quiz and the answer immediately after. Um, so you can run them one at a time or this thing right here will uh, run them all for you automatically. Okay. That's our setup for today. I'm about to start going into the actual like technical SQL stuff unless somebody stops me with another question about getting the environment set up. Everyone good on the environment question? Question is uh, right here, what is this capital T flag for? Um, uh, so Docker Compose and Docker for, uh, there are many reasons to like these programs, um, but one reason why I hate them is that they break basically every rule 
of what makes a good Unixy program Unixy. One of those rules is that you should have consistency between your programs. And Docker Compose and Docker are uh, not consistent in this way. With uh, Docker Compose, if you are wanting to actually run a command in the terminal and run it interactively, you don't put any flags to the exec command. So if I were to do something like this and hit enter right here, you'll see that we get this error message about the input device is not a TTY. A TTY is something that you type manually onto. And it's not a TTY because it has input redirection right here and do, do do so if we want to interact with psql directly we run a command like this but anytime we want to do input redirection on uh, docker compose we have to add a dash t flag right here in order to indicate that uh, the input is not going to come from a tty but going to come from a file or some other source docker uh, behaves in the exact opposite way that by default it expects input not from a terminal window typing things in but from um, uh, like a input redirection or from a file and so when we were doing the docker exec when we wanted to interactively we had to add this dash it flag so docker compose by default adds the dash it flag and it takes away the uh, dash it flag when you um, add the dash t um, Good question. If that explanation uh, doesn't make sense to anybody, that's perfectly okay. You're no, you don't need to know what the dash T does in order to uh, uh, understand everything about the quiz. Did that answer your question? Cool. Good question. Okay. So for the quiz here, um, we're going to well, the main purpose of this quiz is to go over really re weird edge cases about SQL that you may encounter in the Pagilla assignment, uh, but you're not guaranteed to encounter it. And I really want to force you all to understand these weird edge cases. So the quiz goes over these weird edge cases. And all of these weird edge cases boil down to how the, uh, the null values work in SQL. Um, null in SQL the intu intuition about null is null in SQL is like none in Python, um, but uh, the behavior is not exactly the same. And there's a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of weird, confusing edge cases. So we'll start with aggregate functions. We talked a little bit about how aggregate functions work uh, last time, but now we're going to see specifically how they interact with with null values. In our uh, create tables over here. We have two tables, very simple tables, basket A and basket B. Each one just has four uh, entries up here with um, no null values and then some uh, null combinations down here. And on all these problems, uh, these tables are small enough that my hope is you'll be able to work with things either in your head or pencil and paper, uh, but be able to work through them manually and, um, and compute exactly what these uh, things are doing uh, on those on those tables. So now, so this first problem right here, selecting count star from basket A, we saw this last time that the count star is just going to uh, literally count all of the rows in basket A. The star, the glob right here, um, has a actually I guess this is technically not a glob because uh, it's not expanding to anything. This just means that don't consider null values at all. Uh, actually count all of the rows. Um, and so we hit enter, we get a seven right here because there's exactly seven rows in the basket A table up here. Exactly seven rows have been inserted up here and the star doesn't, the star does do what you think it should do. Uh, it counts everything, doesn't care about null values. Where things get weird is, um, well, you also see this command right here, select count one from basket A and uh, this is uh, giving us the same thing right here, seven, seven. Where things get weird is when you pass in a column name like this, so fruit A, count fruit A like this, then it's going to, uh oh, syntax error, oh, I don't have a select in front of it, I didn't copy that. Select count fruit A from basket. When you have something like this, when you have a column name inside of here, it is not going to give you, uh, it's not going to count rows where this particular column is null. So if we come back over to the create tables, uh, the fruit A column is the rightmost column over here. There are two rightmost columns over here with null values. And so they, those don't get counted. We only have these five rows up here that get counted. And so the result down here is five. 
Any questions about that so far? Okay, this next problem down here with the ID, this is the same concept, just it's going off of ID instead of fruit A. Down here, number 32, this is, or line 32, this is where things are starting to get a little bit more tricky. We have this double bar thing. Again, in SQL, the double bar does not mean or like it does in Bash or other programming language. Instead, the double bar means string concatenation. And uh, before actually running this command, I'm just going to come down here and do some examples about what the string concatenation does, how it interacts with null. So if we have, again, a or B like this, it'll concatenate the A and the B together to give us A, B down here. Up here though, we have an ID and a fruit A. The thing to the left is an integer. The thing to the right is a string. Coming back over to the tables, I know the thing to the left is an integer and the thing to the right is a string because in the create table command, that's how it's defined. We have an int right here for ID and fruit B over here is a bear care. Uh, there's a couple of different types for strings inside of SQL. We'll see var care, we'll see just care, and care will have a number, and then we'll also see text. Um, all these strings, all these three things are strings in Python, sorry, strings in uh, uh, Postgres. And any, every, every, every SQL uh, implementation has these three types of text inside of it. Um, if we do something like one or B, an integer to the left and a string to the right. This will automatically get typecast for us into the string type. And so we get one B like this. And uh, it doesn't matter that it's a different type over here. But if we have something, let's see what happens if we have null over here. If we do that, null or B, then we're getting a null down here as the result. In PSQL, it, anytime there's a null value, the null value just gets displayed as being empty. Uh, on your uh, quiz, when you're writing out the answers, um, uh, I would it's fine to just like leave something as empty to indicate null, um, or you can write the word null, which is probably more clear. You could uh, write null right here to indicate that you're getting a null result. Why aren't we getting B? Question is why aren't we getting B? Yeah, great question. The question is why are why does null uh, concatenate with B not give us the answer B? The answer is that null with any operator, doesn't matter what the operator is, null operator something is always null. Uh, that's just the behavior of SQL is that uh, null operator something always reduces to null. This is a weird, again, the, this is the confusing behavior, not obvious at first why things should be this way, but um, it ends up making, uh, like complex SQL queries much simpler, that generally if you have null values in your, uh, in your table, when you're combining them with other things, uh, you want those null combinations to just disappear. So um, yeah, at this point, this is just maybe, if the why doesn't make sense, that's okay. That's just the behavior of every SQL implementation. But good question. Any other questions so far? Oh, uh, so the question is about this uh, select syntax that all the selects that I've been doing previously have a select and then a from and then a table. Here, this select statement right here has no from after it. And um, what this means is that uh, this is just allows you to do like a single computation inside of SQL. And uh, it's always going to give you back exactly one result, whatever the computation is here. Whenever you have a from in your uh, in your select statement, then uh, you always have to have a table name over here, basket A. And now this will do uh, this computation for every row in this table over here. This particular computation happens to not reference any of the rows in this table. So it's the same thing repeated over and over again, seven times, because there's seven rows in this table. So in general, when you have a from clause, you probably want your computation over here to reference one of the columns. So let's do ID concatenate with fruit A like this. This is referencing both of those columns, concatenating to them, them together uh, from this table over here. 
Uh, but the from clause is not actually required in SQL. Um, if you're not referencing tables or columns, if you're just wanting to do a, a simple computation, then you can have select and then the simple computation. On the quiz, uh, we're not going to have all, all of these select clauses on the quiz will have a from statement to the right of it. Um, but if you're just testing, you want to know like what, how does an operator behave, then it's uh, I always do those tests without the from clause. Good question. Here in line 32, in order to actually figure out how this uh, works, because there's multiple things going on inside of it, really what this is testing here is how does the uh, operator right here combine um, these two uh, these two commands together. And so uh, this is the thing that you would have to sort of mentally evaluate in your head or evaluate on paper before writing the final countdown um, that you run this right here. Then you realize that there are three, three rows that do not have any values inside of them, three null rows. And so when we count this particular output, we'll get four right here. And then these three rows will be skipped. So count like that. And we'll get the answer is four because all these no row, null rows, the things being passed inside the count function are null, so they will be skipped. Yes. Question is, how do we view the contents of this table over here? There's two ways. One that works just in this case is that uh, you can look at the insert statement over here in the create tables.sql file. This insert statement tells you all of the rows that have been inserted. Um, the insert statement, you have the columns up here that you're inserting in, and then the values down here that you're inserting. On the quiz itself, you will have a printout of the create tables.sql file in front of you. So you'll know, you'll, you don't have to memorize that these are the seven rows in there. You'll, you can look them up and do your computations based on that. Um, in general, if you just wanna know like, what's the contents of everything in a, in a particular table though, it's select star from the table. And you can see that the, uh, the results of this query right here, match the insert uh, in the create tables.sql. Did that answer your question? Great question so far. Any other questions? Oh uh, yeah, so if you want to limit the number of uh, results, then uh, the clause is a limit at the end. Limit one will give you just like one row, for example, like this. Um, the quiz is not going to ask you to uh, limit your uh, results, um, uh, but the Pajilla homework, I think, does in some spots. Um, good questions. Yes. So, yeah, so here the question is when we ran this command right here, this command has the operator uh, from the problem on line 32, it has this operator right here, but it does not have the aggregate function count. And if we run this, we see that we have uh, three null values down here and three and four non-null values. And the question is, why do we have these three null values down here? The answer is that if we come back over to the create tables.sql file and look inside the contents of basket A, we see that uh, there's these seven rows. On each one of these rows, we're running uh, this particular computation. This computation concatenates the thing on the left with the thing on the right. So it concatenates the integer over here with the string over here. And you can see that these first four lines correspond to these first four lines up here being concatenated with the numbers on the left and the fruits on the right. But then this operator and every operator, when it has a null value passed in, uh, every operator returns a null value um, as its output if one of the input values is null. So here the input value on the left is null combined with cucumber. So the final output down here is null. Um, at this point, yeah, we shouldn't be thinking about uh, efficiency necessarily, but um, SQL will actually, so some operators are very expensive to compute. This operator is cheap to compute, but SQL doesn't even need to compute it. Postgres doesn't need to compute it. It just identifies one of the things as null. So it never even calls the operator to do anything. Um, it just knows the output must be null and can skip doing the actual computation inside of here. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why operators behave this way. 
All great questions so far. Any other questions? Things are gonna get uh, really exciting here uh, really quick. So make sure that if you have questions about things, uh, don't feel like it's too basic of a question. Uh, uh, you should make sure to get those asked. Uh, the next problems down here using the sum instead of the count. Uh, sum works, so it does what, it, what you think it does. It adds up all the contents inside of the, of the parentheses over here, one for each row over here, but it only does it for, uh, uh, it only adds things if the results are non-null. So down here, if we run this, sum one from basket A, the one here is always going to be a non-null value. So for each row in basket A, we're going to add one and get uh, seven because there's seven rows. Some of those rows have null values, but this computation right here does not have a null value. And so sum adds them all together. When we put the ID column in here, the ID column is in a numeric column, one, one, two, three, four. So it makes sense to add those things together. But here we have a null and here we have a null. It's just gonna skip over those and not include them. For the sum operator, you can think of null as being like zeros. It just doesn't affect things. Um, but for other operators, uh, like an average, we wouldn't wanna think of these as zeros because adding zeros will affect our average. It'll just, uh, it just totally skips these lines altogether. So changing this from sum to of one to sum of ID, that 11 here is just four plus three plus two plus one plus one. Okay, one of the confusing things about SQL and uh, I, I don't know, one of my side like hobbies is programming language design and uh, uh, one of the really like ugly things from that perspective about SQL is this distinct operator. There is no other modern programming language where um, there are operators that behave this way. Uh, but this distinct, you can modify the behavior of a function by putting the word distinct in front of a computation. And what this word distinct does is means that before actually running this aggregate function, it's going to remove any duplicates from the computation over here. So let's remind ourselves what, um, so we're working on a problem 39 right here, uh, but rather than just straight up running problem 39, I'm going to first run select fruit A from basket A like this. We get uh, these columns right here, these seven rows as a result. If I were to do the count on these seven rows right here, then we would only be counting these top five rows because again, we don't count the null values down right here. But the distinct operation is going to first remove the duplicates before counting it. So we have two apples right here. So it's going to remove that duplicate apple. Then we'll have these four things that it actually counts. So count distinct fruit A, we get four right here, because again, we're removing the duplicates, um, removing this duplicate apple from our counting operation. The counting, it sort of makes sense, like, okay, counting distinct, that's a normal thing that I might wanna do, counting how many distinct rows there are. This distinct operator though works with every possible aggregate function, so you can like sum distinct things together. I'm not sure semantically why you would wanna do this in any instance, but this is something that you can do, and you'll need to know what this behavior does for the, uh, for the quiz, that it just removes the duplicates before summing things together. Any questions? Yes. Here you go. Yeah, the question is, uh, can you do distinct star? And the answer is no, that uh, star is a uh, special thing for um, just the count aggregate function. This is like a special syntax right here. Um, that uh, you, it doesn't have to be necessarily just a column name. Like you can have a computation over here. Uh, so like we could have distinct one plus ID, something like that. Um, uh, you can have a full, yeah, whatever computation you want, combining even multiple columns together. Uh, but whatever the result of this computation is, it'll remove those duplicates before passing that to the aggregate function. 
Good questions. Okay, um, this next section down here, more uh, weird null behavior, this time inside of the where clause. And what this is emphasizing is that, um, again, anytime you have an operator that uh, uh, takes null as input, it always evaluates to, uh, to null. So down here, if I do something like select null equals null down here. Intuitively, you might think that, oh, these look like the same on the left hand and the right hand side. And so this should give me true. But the answer is this does not give you true. This gives you null. This gives you null because anytime you have an operator, it doesn't matter what that operator is. If there's a null input, the output is guaranteed to be null. Null is always interpreted as, uh, to use Python terminology, it's always interpreted as falsy. So this equation right here, this expression right here will always evaluate to null no matter what the value of fruit a is this will always be null null is falsy and so this um, uh, uh, is always going to be false we're not going to select anything from the basket a over here hit enter you can see that the count is zero if i remove the count star and just have it be star you can see that we get no rows as a result of this operation because even though some fruit values are equal to null the equals operator here always evaluates to null when you have a null input. In order to correctly check if something is null, you have to say is null like this. Is is technically not an operator or function in uh, SQL. It is a uh, keyword built in. And anytime you have is, it must be immediately followed by the word null. And now we get there are uh, four things uh, selected here. Um, uh, like this or sorry the id is the id is four right here and then we have a blank id over here that corresponds in the create tables up here to uh, this line and this line right here we were selecting uh, the fruit a column being null verbally um, you should never say the words like equals null that would be like if i hear somebody say something like equals null that's uh, like instantly, this person has no idea what they're talking about because nothing ever equals null. You have to, like, you should be verbally saying the, the verb you should be using is is uh, when you're thinking out loud or um, designing things that something is null. Um, if you want to say that something is not null, it's okay to add a not right there. It's also equivalent to add a not right here. Uh, something like that. That is equivalent to uh, the not does what it does in other programming languages, negates an expression. So this expression evaluates to true or false, depending on the row. And then the not reverses it right here. Lots of potential for weird confusion going on with uh, these operators here. So you should make sure that you uh, pay attention to this when reviewing for the quiz. But any questions about, about that so far? So uh, review this problem right here. Yeah. Uh, this returns zero rows. The reason this returns zero rows, or, okay, so technically this is one row whose value is zero with the count right here being zero. Um, and then if we remove the count function, just have star, then this returns zero rows. Um, the reason this gives us zero rows is because we have an equal sign over here with a null like this. So this doesn't matter what um, that's, it doesn't matter what is to the left of the equal sign over here. This will always evaluate to null. So where null and so null, where null is equivalent to where false. And so for every row, it runs this condition over here only outputs that uh, row if this condition is evaluated to true. And this condition is always evaluated to false. Uh, so yeah, great question. The question is, what do you actually put for the quiz on these problems? And the answer is that you, uh, uh, you're the. It's it's okay to draw the actual table like this if you want to output the table. Um, but the important thing here is the value that is inside of the table right here is zero. Uh, 
The reason I started with aggregate functions up here at the top is because all of the quiz values, all the quizzes, uh, questions, in order to simplify them, make them as like easy for you two all to grade as possible, um, they're all just going to output like a count or an, um, a sum of something. Um, so it's just the number that's the important part for the quiz. And it's this number here, not this number here. Good questions. And then just to emphasize that the reason why I ran uh, this problem with the star is not because this is a potential quiz problem, but just because this right here helps me understand what this one is doing. And so while you're studying for the quiz, if you're confused about what a problem is doing, the best way to understand what it's doing is to first remove the aggregate function to look at the actual results of the table and then try to understand why are the results of the table the way they are. Good question. Any other questions so far? Okay, so then some of these problems are starting to combine all those different things together. Um, and that's where things will really start to get tricky when, when all these different uh, features of SQL are being combined together. The next um, section down here is about this uh, like and I like operator. In SQL, uh, well, so in most programming languages, an operator is has a specific set of uh, characters that it has to be created out of. An operator in Python is something like plus, star, negative, slash, 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 all these mathematical symbols. When you see these mathematical symbols, uh, just intuitively, you think of there should be something on the left and something on the right. SQL has no restrictions. SQL has no restrictions on the um, what an operator, uh, how it can be formatted on the characters inside an operator. And so the like and I like uh, things over here, this is an operator right here. And so technically what an operator means uh, mathematically is just that it's a two valued function, a function that takes two parameters where you write it uh, using this sort of inline notation where the left parameter is to the left and the right parameter is to the right. So this is uh, like, I mean, we read it just like fruit A is like this expression over here. Um, and this thing is technically an operator, this thing in, in the middle. So fruit A like this thing over here. And um, what the like uh, does is that it checks to see if this thing on the left matches this pattern on the right. The star, or sorry, the uh, parenthesis over here, the parenthesis in like acts the same as the glob. In, in the shell as post six blob. So any row that uh, has anything or in its fruit A column, anything to the left of an A followed by anything to the right of the A. I'll go ahead and run this. We'll take a look at the results. And again, in order to better interpret the results, I will remove this count star right here. Select star from basket A. We see that we get orange and banana as results down here because orange has an A inside it right here. So does banana. But if we come back over to the uh, to the table, you can see that we do not get Apple because Apple has the capital A and capital A does not match the lowercase a. I could change this so that instead of lowercase a, we're using the uppercase a and now that will match Apple. Or I can make it case insensitive by adding an i out front. The i in i like is short for insensitive. And so if I do that, then it matches apple and orange and banana. Uh, the behavior in Postgres of like and I like follows the SQL standard here, um, but uh, other uh, SQL databases and in particular SQL lights, um, uh, they have no distinction between like and I like and everything is case insensitive. Um, any questions about this? Yes. Question is here, what's the difference between double quotes and single quotes here? If you try to use double quotes, again, anytime you see double quotes, the thing inside double quotes must be a column name. So what this is looking for is the thing on the left is a column name, and then the pattern it's comparing to is a column uh, named A. There is no column named A, so we get this uh, error message like this. Um, 
Uh, so 99% uh, of the time in SQL, no matter what database you're using, 99% of the time you'll be wanting to use single quotes for things instead of double quotes. But like, how do I not just use uh, the like, function you have to like, backslash? Like, oh, yeah. So the question is, um, Let's talk about strings for a little bit. This is not going to be something that's explicitly on the quiz, but it is does come up in the Pajillo assignment. So let's uh, do that. Let's say I have uh, the word ain't, uh, or let's do isn't like this. How do I actually get this to be a, uh, a valid SQL string? Here you can see that um, uh, it's not being interpreted as a string right now, that this is opening the string. This right here closes the string. This opens the string. And so we're still inside of a string environment. And uh, oops, so that's not giving us what we're hoping for. Um, in order to escape a string in uh, SQL, you use two quotation marks next to each other like this. This is different than most programming languages where you this would be a backslash to escape. Uh, but in uh, SQL, uh, you put two things next to each other and that's an escape version of that character. This is really ugly to look at. And so nobody actually does this in practice. Instead, what we use is we use dollar sign quotation marks. And dollar sign quotation marks are like the sort of double quotation marks in uh, Python that uh, this and this is just a quotation mark right here. Uh, it means everything inside of that is a quote. Just really ugly syntax for doing that. Uh, we can't use double quotation marks because then it'll think this is a column name and there is no column with that name. Uh, good question, uh, but we'll move on now to uh, uh, some group buys. So let's set no number. I'm going to just copy and paste this command here down into the uh, uh, Postgres. And so the group by uh, does, so we talked about this last time that if we remove the group by, and well, anytime you have an aggregate function with another column inside of it, then you need to have a group by clause. Um, and what the group by does is it takes any two columns that are uh, put that are the same. So here we have fruit A, two versions of those that are the same. It's going to pass that to the aggregate function right here. So the aggregate function here will only be applied to columns rows where the this particular column is the same. Here we have apple and apple are the same. And so it's going to count both of those together and put a two to the right. None of these match. So they'll have a one to the right. The nulls here, it, does, uh, it doesn't use like the equals equality. It uses the is null. So the, the, the null rows will get grouped together as well. I hit enter. You can see the null row got uh, grouped together. And there's two of them. There will potentially be problems on the quiz uh, with group by, in which case you'd have to um, output a, a small little table, something like this. Um, for, if, it, if it has group by inside of it, you would have to draw the table. And then it's anytime I have group by, it's also going to specifically specify the order. And so you'll have to get the order correct. Yes. Um, question is like alphabetically, how does null get uh, ranked? And yeah, null is always going to be the um, sort of the biggest value, no matter what you're comparing against. And so here, because it's uh, ordering descending, null gets put at the top. We change that to ordering ascending, null will get put at the bottom. It's possible to change uh, the behavior to make null values be treated as the smallest thing instead of the largest thing, uh, but you don't need to know how to do that for the quiz. Any questions on the group by? The main thing here is that nulls do get grouped together. Okay, 
Where this is going to get confusing is there are, we've seen the where clause. There's also a having clause that's very, very similar to each other. The difference is that where clauses will happen before a group by occurs, and a having clause will happen after the group by occurs. So down here, uh, we're, this is just modifying the, um, uh, the previous problem, adding a single where clause right here, where ID is null. And so this right here, we'll go ahead and um, select uh, fruit A from basket A where ID is null. Anytime you have a where clause and you want to investigate how is it behaving, then the thing to do is just to remove the aggregate function, remove the group by and see what goes on. And you can see that here, this is um, just giving me these two rows back as a result, cucumber and another null. The cucumber comes from this insert right here where the ID is null. And the, the null comes from this null right here where the ID is also null. And then it's applying the group by fruit A. So we'll add in the count star again and the group by fruit A. In this case, there's only, there we go. There's only two values. Each one occurs exactly once. So we just get one for each of those two values. The key thing here is that this where clause this is null happened before we did the aggregates. And it's only possible in this case for this to happen before because the ID here isn't mentioned up here. So if we did the aggregate before doing this, then there would be no way to check this condition right here. The having clause in contrast will happen after we do the aggregations. So um, let's come down to find an example where there's a having. Here, um, so we're selecting everything but then we only want to keep those rows after the um, grouping where the count star is greater than or equal to one. So I'm going to first run this. You'll see that there's these two results down here. If we want to inspect why is a having problem behaving the way it is, we'll just rerun this problem without the having clause. So I'll take these three up here, run that, and then add the order by right here. This gives me these results right here. And then uh, we can think about, okay, why is the having clause behaving the way it is? We look at those, the columns over here, like count star and see which of these satisfy this condition right here. Only the apple and the null rows satisfy that condition. So these three rows will get removed and the other two rows will be kept by adding the having. And that's why we get these results right here. If you're trying to do a filtering on an aggregate function, you must be inside the having clause because only the having clause will have access to the aggregate function because it's after the group by. Um, if you tried to do it on a where clause, the where clause happens before grouping by, so before the aggregate occurs, and so it uh, will give you an error. Yes? So then this order the question is, um, uh, how does order matter? And the answer is for the purposes of the quiz, you will have to have things in the correct order because of the order by right here is going to be part of the problem. Uh, for the uh, Pajilla assignments, anytime you have multiple rows in order to get consistent results, you will have to put an order by clause inside of your outputs uh, or inside your SQL. Um, otherwise, um, whenever you don't have an order by clause, uh, Postgres is allowed to return things in what, in an arbitrary order, whatever is most efficient for it. And so every time you run it, you're likely to get things in different orders, which will interfere with uh, the test cases. Um, I was just asking about the order in which the, the Oh, I see. Yeah, the question is, um, does the order that these problem commands are being run in matter at all? And the answer is that uh, it does not. Select statements are idempotent statements. They don't change the database in any way. And so uh, you can run these commands as many times as you want and it won't affect things. Uh, you can skip commands, go backwards, doesn't matter. The uh, commands that would affect things are things like the insert commands, uh, but the quiz won't uh, do those at all. And your homework assignment, uh, this homework assignment does not have insert commands. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, so if you put like order by, like as your first like command after the select, like, like, mm. 
the question is, can you change around the order of these things down here? And the answer is uh, no, that uh, the, uh, yeah, the uh, SQL is very strict about the actual like order that you place all these clauses in. They are in this order to be suggestive of the order that the database is going to uh, interpret all these clauses and uh, execute these clauses by. Um, uh, but yeah, they, they have to be in, in that specific order or you'll get errors, syntax errors. Yes. Um, within a SQL command, there is no like order of things. It just does it all by itself. In the, um, if you run the program with uh, input redirection, something like this, then it'll just pass in one line at a time, running from the top to the bottom. Um, uh, but from for like the quiz, you can do it in any order you want because the order doesn't affect the results at all. Uh, So it's syntax wise inside of a single command, the order does matter, um, but you won't get like this. If we put group by after having, you'll just get a syntax error. You don't get different results. You just get a syntax error. And you can do that in the quiz. The quiz does not ask you to write any SQL. Um, so it's just asking you to read the SQL. So syntax errors won't matter for the quiz. Uh, the Pajilla homework though asks you to write it. So uh, you'll have to be able to interpret the, the error message if you get a syntax error. The syntax error messages from Postgres are annoyingly, frustratingly bad um, because of the constraints of the SQL language um, and they just can't really be made better. Yes. Oh, we're gonna pause that. I wanna make sure that we finish this today. Uh, I'm going to pause. Yeah, I think that'll take us on uh, on the wrong direction right now. Uh, so I'll take a look at that after. Uh, let's keep going down. The really important thing about this quiz is going to be the join command here. I want to make sure that we have plenty of time to talk about the, this join operator. Uh, this is an operator that uh, uh, most people over the next couple of weeks, you're going to go back and forth between feeling like you 100% understand it to 0% understand it. And you will probably never like be in the middle of that. And uh, you will alternate between the two things many times. I still alternate between feeling like I fully understand it and zero understand it. Um, we're going to, if you've seen the join operator before, you probably had a like intuitive explanation about what it's doing. We are going to go through the actual, like more formal definitions of what all the different types of joins are. Um, and all joins are based off of something called a cross join. And so that's what we're going to start with here. A cross join in SQL, this is the, uh, the syntax for it. You'll notice that we have two tables now in this command, basket A comma basket B, basket A comma basket B. And so we'll see what exactly this is doing here. Again, anytime I want to interpret one of these uh, commands, it's better to do it without the aggregate function and just use the contents of the, uh, between the parentheses like this. So select star from basket A comma basket B and I'll hit enter. And here you'll notice that now there are four columns instead of two columns. The first two columns right here, ID and fruit A, they come from the first table in my command, basket A. This has two columns, ID and fruit A. So these two columns right here, ID, fruit A, correspond to these two columns right here, ID and fruit A. If we look at the basket B table, it also has an ID column and a fruit B column. So this ID right here corresponds to the ID from basket B, and this fruit B right here corresponds to this fruit B from basket B. 
And then the cross join is what it does is for each row in in uh, in the first each row in the first table, the first row in the first table is just one comma apple like this. For each row in the first table, it uh, duplicates the that row for every row in the second table. Um, so here, these first seven lines right here, or I guess that's eight lines. On the right hand side, you can see all of these are different over here. All of these are different because those correspond to the second table, the eight lines right here from the second table. The first uh, leftmost eight lines over here though, those are all the same because they correspond to the first row, this row right here of the first table. Now, after you do that, we have the second row from the first table. Here, the second row from the first table happens to be the same again. So we get another duplicate eight lines that are all exactly the same. When we get to the third row of the first table, now the third row is different. And uh, uh, so here on the left two columns, everything is the same, matching this third row. The right two columns, everything's different, one for each row. What the problem's actually asking you to do is a count star. Uh, I'm, not, I'm never going to ask you to like write out such a, re, such a large table, uh, but I will ask you to do some math to just figure out how many rows there's going to be. And if you uh, think about it, uh, you should be able to figure out that it's going to, the total number of rows is going to be the number of rows in the left table times the number of rows in the right table. Um, so there's seven rows in the left table, eight rows in the right table. So there's 56 rows total. Every other possible type of join um, is going to be this join right here plus a where clause that is construct constructed in a special way uh, to have different semantic meaning. This is rarely something that you will use in practice, um, uh, but it's just the underlying thing behind all the actual practical join statements. Are there any questions about what the cross join is doing? Oh, yeah. I don't get why the count is going to be six. I guess there's enough time for the number of rows. Why? Why? Uh, there's why seven. Do we why do we multiply? Yeah. Um, so the question is, why do we multiply to get the count? And the answer is that for each row in the left table, we will repeat it once for every row in the right table. So you can think of it like a for loop for each row in the left, do the, the row in the right. And so that results in, in multiplying them. Yep. Uh, a very common pattern with the cross join is to, uh, uh, with ID rows, um, to check to see whether they're equal to each other and only keep the results of the cross join when these two uh, rows are equal to each other. Here, you'll notice that these two column names are the same. They're both the ID column. And so I can't just say like when ID equals ID or I can't just reference the ID column by itself because it doesn't know which one of these two ID columns to take. In order to specify which table I want the ID column from, I have to do basket A dot ID. So the ID column from basket A, so this ID column right here, if that's equal to the basket B ID column, then uh, keep the row. If we rerun that, then you'll see there's five rows. We can see what they actually are. Here's the five rows. And you'll notice that it has removed all of the rows where the ID is null in either of the two columns. Again, when you have uh, an operator, if one of these two things evaluates to null, then uh, you don't keep the row because the whole thing will evaluate to null. It's still allowed to have null values in our result though, down here, the fruit A has a null value right here because um, there's no, uh, the condition here doesn't depend on fruit A. So it's totally okay for that row to keep, uh, to stay around. Any questions on that? Uh, for Sam then, so. Question is, you're not actually using the join. Um, um, 
So this, so there is still a cross join going on up here. We know there's a cross join because there's this comma separating the two tables right here. But you're right that it is filtering out the vast majority of these rows. Um, and uh, it turns out that this operation is so common that it has its own uh, special name, which is the inner join. And so if we jump down here all the way to the bottom, uh, this second to last note right here says the cross join with an equality addition is so common that it has this special name inner join. And we can rewrite this expression up here as from basket A, inner join basket B, and then on basket A dot ID equals basket B dot ID. And this is the same exact thing. Um, so the way to understand an inner join to really understand what's going on is that it's just a cross join with an equality constraint. Whatever you have down here, this uh, just is like a cross join, but this is in the where clause. Uh, did that answer your question some more? Okay. Uh, yeah, great question. So the question is, uh, here we we're using the join keyword. The inner join is the most common type of join. So that is just uh, the join keyword by itself. The cross join is uh, so rarely used in practice that it doesn't even have a keyword. Um, it's just the comma between the tables. Um, it's also so common in practice to um, join tables that have the same actual column name in both of those tables. Usually if in our database, we have two tables with the same column name, it means we're gonna be joining on that column extremely often. That there's a special syntax for that with this using clause where you just specify exactly one uh, column and this will de-sugar into an equality constraint like this. Um, for your... Uh, this first Pagilla homework assignment, uh, I think all of my joins that get implemented are, uh, are, you can use this using clause with an inner join like this. If I rerun this command right here, let's see, this has some more extra stuff in it, so I'll just type it out down here. Change this from an on to a using and delete all of those down here. You see, if I try to do it without the parentheses, it doesn't like that. You do have to have the parentheses around you do have to have the parentheses around that like this. It also combines those two column names together. Uh, now there's only one ID right here because the using forces the ID from the fruit A or the basket A table to be equal to the basket B table. So now it uh, just includes a single ID in its output. So the using also restricts, also will remove the sort of the unneeded column there. Any questions about the using clause? Okay. The thing that's going to be like really tricky for the quiz is when we're combining all of these different concepts together. Um, so let's take something like this. I think this is probably the, the hardest problem in the practice right here. Um, put it down in here. So we have a select statement right here. Go ahead and run it. Select statement, two columns here. So fruit A and an aggregate function. I know that because there's an aggregate function, there must be a group by down here. And uh, anytime I'm trying to fully understand what's going on in a long uh, command like this, I can start by removing the having clause. The having clause again, will just filter after the uh, group by. So we'll just remove that there. And we get that. So we have these two results without the having clause. The having clause just eliminated this result right here from our results because um, it only wanted things whose count was greater than three. And this one's equal to two. Now we have to just understand what's the other things uh, going on here. We have uh, the group by right here. Uh, in order to understand the, the group by and the aggregate, we can remove the group by and then remove the aggregate function like this, run that. And so this is the results of just the join. And now we can think about, okay, how do we uh, aggregate these things uh, together where we're grouping by on the fruit A, grouping by on the fruit A, we see there's four of those over here. And then uh, there's two oranges and none of them have null IDs. So when we count them, we'll count them all. So we'll get four up here and two down here. 
And then we have to just understand the actual uh, equality uh, thing that we're joining on down here. We're joining on the two fruits uh, being equal to each other. So this is the full cross join. And then thinking about when is fruit A going to be equal to fruit B. It's only those uh, situations where um, uh, those two columns are equal to each other. We have four apples down here because there are two apples in the first basket A and two apples in the second basket A, two oranges because there are two oranges in the second basket A and only one orange in the first basket A. Um, so it's like multiplying those, uh, uh, those subsets together. Um, any questions on anything? At all from the quiz? Yes. Mm. Question is, does the join order matter? The answer is sort of, kind of not really. So super helpful, huh? So if we do select star from uh, basket A comma basket B like this, then uh, you'll see that the uh, basket A is to the left, basket B is to the right. Press Q to quit, up arrow, just change these orders over here, basket B comma basket A. And now just the basket B order is to the left and the basket A order is to the right. The only way that uh, join order affects things is at least for either an inner join or a cross join, the only way that join order affects things is how it changes the column order that star gives us. Um, otherwise, things are exactly the same. Uh, yeah, the only thing that's different is if you have the star, what the, the order is and horizontally in that table. Otherwise, absolutely everything else is the same. There are other join types where um, the order matters, but for the inner join and the cross join order does not matter. Yes. Uh, great question. The question is uh, uh, like, why do we use one join over another? Uh, the answer is that this is very like a case by case basis. Uh, and usually when people are designing their databases, they, uh, have particular joins in mind that they're going to be using a lot. At this point, uh, you will never use the uh, cross product join. You'll never use the cross join in practice, <coughs> except for just understanding the other joins. Um, and uh, for Pajilla, you always use the, uh, the inner join for this first assignment. Next week, we'll talk more about like the semantics about why you would want to use one over the other and um, uh, but yeah, now it's just like the mechanics of what's actually going on. Good question. Uh, just not ready to answer it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the question is about problem 10 from the homework. Uh, we'll go uh, do that here in a little bit. Um, does anybody have any questions on the quiz? Okay, then this will be our um, official end of class and I'll stick around for like, I don't know, five or 10 minutes just doing homework problems that people have questions on. Uh, feel free to stick around or to not stick around. Um, question was on the... Uh, Pajilla homework. So I'm in my Pajilla homework folder that we've been working in, which I put in the temp folder instead of the project folder for some reason. Um, temp Pajilla homework. So I'm opening that up. And when I'm opening up problem, uh, a, a new problem, I like to use the globs, star, 10, star, something like that, dash P. Um, oh, there we go, in all the folders, there we go. So we have the three things right here. Here's the actual uh, problem that we have. 
And uh, down here, let's do docker compose up dash D, make sure we have a database to work with and get back to my psql command. And yep, we're in the, the Pajilla database down here and uh, we can access everything. And up here it says, use a join to list each film and the number of actors who are listed for that film. If we come over to the uh, Pajilla project again, so clicking here and uh, down here on the um, uh, this schema picture, the film and uh, this film actor table right here is uh, what we're joining together. I think it says for this problem, yep, film and film actor uh, here. Whenever we have a uh, two tables that we're joining together, again, we'll be thinking about the, uh, the IDs that are the same between these two tables. So we have film ID up here in film and then film ID and this film actor. And those are gonna be the columns that we'll want to join on. So down here, we'll just start by a select star from uh, film and everything's gonna be an inner join, join, film actor, and then I'll use the using clause on film ID like this and uh, hit enter. This gives me a whole bunch of things that I don't think I need, a whole bunch of columns that I don't need because I have this star over here. And that's why the output has so much uh, sort of junk inside of it. But again, if I start scrolling, then it starts printing it more uh, nicely. And use a join to list each film and the number of actors who are listed for that film. So uh, this is saying that uh, to list each film and the number of actors for that film, I'm going to want to group by the films and then count uh, uh, the actor IDs. So select um, film ID comma count actor ID like this. And do, do, do. Uh, anytime I have an aggregate function, I'll need to add a group by clause group by all the, the columns that I am not aggregating on. So film ID like that, hit enter. And uh, so there's all my film IDs and my counts. I'm just gonna check the expected over here. We can see that uh, it does have the film ID listed, but it also has the title listed in the output. So I'm going to add my uh, title column over here. Doo -doo -doo title like that, title comma film ID. And there we go. Now I have those three columns. And now I just have to think about the ordering of those columns. So we come back over here. It looks like it's ordered by film ID. The, this column goes uh, from smallest to largest. So I'm going to add an order by, order by film ID. And I wanna go ascending here like that. Oh, that was not exactly what we wanted though, because now film ID is starting at one uh, up to uh, whatever it goes up to. That's not what we're looking for. Coming back over here to expected, it is going ascended by film ID over here. But if we look more closely now at the actor count over here, it all starts with one, but then it goes to two and gets the bigger numbers. So it looks like it was ordered by actor count ascending first and then film ID. Uh, so down here, let's go order by actor count ascending comma film ID ascending. Oops, and now, uh, let's meet you. so yeah, I typed in actor count down here. I'm getting this error message saying order by actor count. Uh, actor count does not exist because I'm referring to, I was trying to refer to this column right here, but it doesn't, uh, that's not the name of that column. I'm gonna check back over here on the, um, the expected output, the act, it, it, the column name should be actor count. So in order to change that column name, I'm going to do as actor count like that and hit enter. And now it's um, ordering by the actor count correctly. Um, and so this looks like it matches to me. Uh, I don't see anything jumping out as an obvious problem. So I'll go ahead and copy this now over to um, the problem right here, copy that, colon W, save that, come down here, control D, 
and uh, control R for my check answers command, hit enter. And then let's take a look here. Problem 10 is still failing. Oh dear. Let's come look at my results now. What I actually got, colon E again, will load those results up. And let's try to go back and forth between these two. And at this point, it doesn't, I can't see like any particular differences between the two. Um, so we're gonna use a slightly more advanced technique to try to find these differences. Um, in order to figure out what this advanced technique is, I'm going to take a look inside of this check answers problem and uh, see how it's actually computing the difference right here. You can see it's using this diff command right here, diff. Uh, diff takes two files as input and shows the differences between those two files. So down here, if I run diff uh, expected 10 dot out and results 10 dot out, it'll show me what are the, uh, the lines that are different between these files. And here we can see there's only uh, two lines that are different, the gunfighter Mussolini and this fire rolls, and they are uh, uh, the, the contents of the lines themselves are the same, they're just in uh, the wrong order. The details of how this uh, syntax works is this tells me the line number in the previous file, the file on the left over here. Uh, line 27, this D says delete this line. Here's what that line looks like. And then similarly on line uh, 20, uh, uh, on line 278, we're going to add this line to the second file, the greater than right here, meaning that we're going to add it. And then the firewalls down here doing the same thing. I think uh, uh, my guess about what's going on here, if I come back up here and look at fire space wolves, that's line 407, come over here, slash fire space wolves, that's line 409. And what's happening is these lines here are uh, not being ordered that, um, um, take a look at those two. Now, if we compare the difference, we can see there is in fact some differences. Uh, it's gonna make them both be on line 402 right now, so they match. And so we can see that it's only the fire um, lines that are being different like this. Um, and I think my order by was I've ordered by film ID, but maybe I should have ordered by the title. So let's, instead of ordering by film ID, let's try ordering by the title right here, come down here, rerun that check answers. And now line problem 10 is passing. Um, so the, yeah, there's a lot of sort of weird, um, edge cases in the ordering that you'll have to sort through for all of these problems in order to uh, get them working. And uh, that's a little bit, again, intentional because um, this is the like the standard way of testing things. The only way that exists to, to test things in SQL is by just checking to see whether the outputs of things exactly match each other. And so you always have to really be careful about your order by clauses in your test cases when working with SQL. And again, the problem statements up here, um, the specifications of the problem are not that detailed where they actually specify the, the ordering because that's not really part of the semantics of the problem, but you still have to get that part down to get the, the problem to pass. Any questions about what I did for this problem? Yeah, the question is to go over the diff command again. I'm going to, in order to do that, well, uh, first, so I'll press control R down here, go find my diff command again. And if I run this right now, um, you can see that uh, the difference between these two files is, uh, uh, there is no difference between them. There's just a little white space difference. Um, and so this is what the output looks like. I'm going to change this to what it used to be to film underscore ID is what I was sorting by the first time. Rerun my check answers. Rerunning the check answers redoes the results file. And so now when I redo the diff, we get uh, the original uh, diff differences that I had before. The uh, reading this, anytime you see these lines with number, letter, number like this, these are line numbers. Um, and uh, the really important thing is these lines down here with the less than and the greater thans. Uh, the less than sign means that we're like deleting this line. Less than, you should think of it like an arrow, like go away. 
and then greater than like an arrow who come come go to the right the right is good um and so we're adding this line and it's very common when you're reading diffs to see like uh the same line repeated multiple times that rather than specifying that we're moving one line from one location to another location it's easier or equivalent to just say we're deleting the line from this location right here and adding it to this location over here so here we're uh deleting uh this line from the leftmost file and adding this line to the rightmost file um yeah, I think, I don't know, for me, the, the line numbers over here aren't particularly useful. The thing that's useful is actually looking at these parts right here. Um, and if I really care about the line numbers, then I would probably want to see the context as well. And so I would just open up the files in Vim, like up here, colon tab E. Oh, I already have them opened. Oh, nice. Colon E to reopen both of these. And then use the slash command to search to find this line, uh, gun fighter Mussolini, uh, line 277, we're deleting that. Um, and then compare that to the new one and see where it was added to. Um, one last thing before I come up for air is that you'll see that uh, multiple lines here are being changed because um, deleting a line and adding another line is going to change uh, multiple lines together. So uh, this gunfighter moon is not explicitly listed down here as being something that changed, um, but it is in fact changing. Yes, question. Was there a question? Okay, uh, did this answer? Yes. Okay. Any other questions about diff? Okay. This is still recording, yeah? Yeah. Okay, Olivia. Um, off the top of my head, that seems like it's probably an issue with like a, a where clause and what you're uh, uh, finding there. Um, I do have a meeting in five minutes though, so I don't think I have time to take a look at that in detail. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to stop this.